Hi, I'm Marty McKenzie with His Love Ministries. Welcome to the Least of These Podcasts. We reach out to those the world has forgotten. If you'd like to know more about us and how you can donate to help us fulfill our mission, go to hisloveministries.net. Thank you very much and God bless you. Amen. One day we'll exchange the old rugged cross for a crown. Right now we got to keep on keeping on. Keep on hanging on to the Lord and and going through life and, and persevering. So as today we're going to get into chapter 9 finally. John chapter 9. And we're going to look at probably the first... Maybe 10 or 11 verses and see how far we get this morning. John chapter 9. This is the miracle that is the healing of the man's eyes. He actually is a man born from birth, congenitally blind, which means he really has never had any eyes at work. And if you've ever seen anybody that has been born blind from birth, they birth they really don't you know have really a whole lot in the way of eyes and their eyes are kind of sunk back not even formed or if they've not been used in a long time they're kind of sunk back and and not really there and so Jesus is going to have to create the man a whole brand new set of eyeballs as we look at that section this morning remember this is going to be the illustration John chapter 8 that Jesus said he's the light of the world. And in John chapter 9 he's going to illustrate that by bringing light to this man's eyes who has never been able to see. And if you remember the Bible always speaks of us being in darkness. That we walk in darkness. That Jesus being the light of the world. Light stands for holiness and purity and righteousness. And darkness stands for evil and immorality and untruth and error. And so John loves this term light and darkness. And he uses it a lot in the book of John. But he really uses it a lot in the book of 1 John. He talks about us walking in the light as Jesus is in the light. The bottom line is, is when he heals this man and he brings light to his eyes... It is a picture of the spiritual darkness that we walk in. And He gives us light and causes us to be saved. And then we see the true way to live. And we can see the light. As some people used to say, you you see some of the TV shows or something. They say, I see the light. I see it. I see it. You know, and, and people get saved. That means they understand the truth. And I was just thinking about that verse in Peter, and I can't remember where it's at exactly, but it says that He called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And so the Bible tells us in Ephesians that we were once children of darkness and we walked in darkness, but now He has made us to walk in the light, so we need to keep on walking in the light. Walk in truth, walk in holiness, walk in purity. And follow Jesus Christ. So let's read about the first 12 verses this morning. John chapter 9, he says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned this man of his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and he made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sin. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed 
and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. So first thing that happens here, now remember what's going on in the end of chapter 8. Remember the chapter divisions are put here by men, right? The chapter divisions, somebody broke the Bible up into verses and chapters so that we could get hold of this place and somebody say turn to John chapter 8. Somebody put the verses and put the chapter divisions in here and some places are good and sometimes they're bad and I don't know what you do with this one but really this is the continuation of what happened in Jesus in John chapter 8 where it says in verse 59 he says then they took up strong stones to throw at him because remember what did he say? He said, I, before Abraham was, I am. He said, I'm God. And then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. So that's the key word, so passed by. He passed out of their midst. He hid himself so that they couldn't kill him because it wasn't his time. And then it says, now as Jesus passed by, he's just left these folks who were trying to stone him, who were trying to kill him. And instead of getting out of Dodge and leaving and running hard as he can from them, as he passes by these people, it says that he saw a man who was blind from birth. Now Jesus even though his life was just in danger just a few seconds before, he is never opposed to stopping and helping somebody, right? One of the things that we uh, really need to realize is that people, that so many times we think we're the most important thing. But, But other people, God wants us to say that we need to esteem others higher than ourselves it says in Philippians 2 not take care of your own needs but think of others more highly than yourself in other words quit worrying about yourself all the time and take care of somebody else right and that's what Jesus did he wasn't worried about it he passes out the crowd and he says he saw a man blind from birth as he was passing by that crowd and his disciples instead of feeling sorry for him or whatever they, they look at him and they say at Jesus and they say Rabbi because he's the teacher remember Rabbi means teacher he says who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind y'all remember the whole book of Job right whole book of Job whatever his friends say you must have done something wrong Job or else you wouldn't be in this position you must have sinned. You must have done something wrong. And Job keeps saying, no, I did not. No, I did not. No, I did not. And they say, well, Job, just get over it, man. Just admit it. Tell us what you did. You did something wrong. Confess it to God. Confess it to us and God will heal you. And many times people have the idea that sickness is caused by sin. And you know what? All sin ultimately All sickness ultimately is caused by sin because in the garden, what happened? Adam and Eve sinned, death entered in, sickness and all those things entered into the world. But just because we're sick or get sick does not mean that we did something wrong to cause that particular sickness, right? And we need to understand that because a lot of people think and when people are sick and when people are suffering and when people are going through hard times, we talked about that last week, didn't we? James chapter 1, he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Various means all kinds of trials. It means sickness. It means, you know, your legs don't work right. It means things don't work right. And life happens and you have a hard time, no matter whether it's physical problems or dealing with people or whatever you go through but no matter what you go through sometimes we did sin and James deals with that at the end of the book and he says if a man has sinned let him confess his sins to the elders and then they'll anoint him with oil and since he has sinned the, the prayer of faith will heal him 
And that's what that whole point is of anointing with oil and all that. But most people want to say, well, you're sick because you did this, that, and the other. But in most cases, we're sick because we just get sick. We're human beings. And because sin entered the world, we're sick. But the Jews had this theology, this teaching that whoever got had a problem, either themselves or their their family members must have sinned. They even went so far, you know, the Bible tells us that the sins of the fathers and the fathers' fathers will be visited upon the sons and the daughters, even into the third and fourth generation of those who hate it, hate Jesus or hate God. And what that means is the things that the evil people do, they teach their kids by example, right? Any of y'all ever tell your kids, don't do as I say, but do but don't do as I do, but do as I say? You ever heard that before? Behavior is caught, not taught. You can tell that kid all day long, don't do the things I do, but what they see you do and what are they going to do? They're going to imitate you, right? What happens when evil people live, you know what they do? Their kids see what they do and they grow up that way a lot of times. And they do the same things their parents do. So that's why the Bible says that the sins of the fathers and the fathers' fathers will be visited upon the children even unto the third and the fourth generation. And there was a point where one of the prophets asked, was asked and he said, you know, there's a proverb about the, about the children's teeth being set on edge because the father has eaten sour grapes. God doesn't punish our children because of what we've done. But they even said that if a woman was pregnant and she went to an idol temple and worshipped, that that child was then sinning. Our children could sin in the womb and then that's why they might be born blind or sick or some problem. But that was all sheer madness. Jesus is going to tell us right here, look what He says in verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sin, but that, there's the condition, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. The Bible tells us that God allows people sometimes to go through things. We talked about that last week in James, right? That we go through things... We go through trials, we go through troubles so that God can make us more like Him, right? That I said that story about that, uh, I don't know if I told that story last week about Michelangelo finding that uh, that weird shaped piece of marble and it had been laying around for years. It was a beautiful, beautiful marble. Marble was beautiful, but, he, but nobody knew what to do with it because it was such a weird shape. And he said, I see a lion in that marble and that piece of marble and they said well how do you get a a lion out of that piece of marble they said I just chop away everything that doesn't look like a lion and that's what God does to us he he knocks everything off of us that doesn't look like him and he uses trials and trouble and tribulation to do it and so that's what Jesus is saying this man wasn't born blind because something he or his parents did but he was born blind that the glory of God should be revealed. That people should see how great God is. That God had a plan and a purpose that this man one day would be saved, that he would be healed by Jesus and he would be given a brand new set of eyeballs and he would be able to see. So he says, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in Him. Verse 4, I must, and a lot of your newer translations say we must because it really says that we must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. So Jesus is basically saying that we, the people of God, must work the works of Him who sent Jesus. In other words, Remember what Jesus said to the disciples? He says, as the Father sent me, so I what? Send you, right? What He's saying is that every one of us 
as disciples of God, as believers in Christ, are called to do good works. We don't go to heaven because we do good works. We're not saved because of good works. The Bible says it's by grace through faith that is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But then verse 10 in Ephesians chapter 2 says, But you are God's workmanship. You are God's poem. You are God's masterpiece. That word workmanship is the word poema. And it means poem. It means masterpiece. It means workmanship. When you write a poem or you write a or you or you paint a painting or you do something that's incredible work of art, it takes time, right? You just don't throw something on the paper and everybody says, Oh wow, you know, that's a ten million dollar painting, right? It takes time to create a masterpiece. And the Bible says that we are God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece. We are God's poem. He is working on us and He is finishing us and He is making us. But we are created to do good works. Not to be saved by good works, but to do good works. That's what God calls us to do. And if you know anything about the whole book of James, it says if a man has faith and he doesn't have works, that one's faith is dead. In other words, if you're truly saved, you're going to do some things for God. You don't do them to get saved, but you do because you are saved. That's that song that we sing, bright in the corner where you are, you don't have to wait and do some great deed afar, but you just bright in the corner right where you are, right? And I've told you all in the past that, that if you're here, you're, you're breathing, and, you've got, uh, and you're a Christian, that God has something for you to do, right? I mean, you can pray for me. You can pray for these folks in this facility. You can pray for more people to come, more to be saved. You can go next door and when they're sick and don't feel good or are they they lonely and depressed and they need some company, you can go over there and be their friend. You can be their company. You can weep with them when they weep. And you can laugh with them when they laugh. And you can be their friend. Y'all need each other in here. Because your family's not always around and some of you don't see them very much, but, but you, you need to be there for each other. And so we need to work the works of Him who sent us. The Bible says in Matthew 28, it says, Go. That's not the key command, but it says, Go and make disciples, baptizing them in my name in Ju- Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. You can't just lay in your bed all day and do anything, do something for God. <laughs> you have to get up out of bed. It, it, it says make disciples, but how do you make disciples? By going, right? A lot of people aren't coming to the church, and some of y'all are inviting people to church. Hey, that's, that's what's being called to do here. Invite them to church. Encourage them. Pray for them. You know, talk to them about the Lord. Tell them to come Join the church service. And you know, there's still people out there, y'all's age and on down, that, that don't know the Lord. Because not everybody's been in a church that teaches the right thing. Unfortunately, there's a lot of churches out there that teach you go to heaven by doing good works. But that's not the way you get there. The Bible here is speaking about this blind man and, and he's... Jesus tells us, He says, I must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. Because the night is coming. Jesus one day wouldn't be with them. And one day the time will be done when we can't work anymore. When there won't be any more opportunity to tell people about the Lord. Either we get to where we're incapable or Jesus comes back and are we go into the great tribulation and the night is coming when no man can work. And maybe he's speaking of that time when, when Jesus is on the cross and it gets dark for three hours. You ever thought about that? Why did it get dark for three hours while Jesus was on the cross? My, my personal theory is, and I hope this is right, but that Jesus said He's the light of the world. He said, while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world, right? And now He tells us, ye are the lights of the world. 
But my personal theory is is that Jesus, since light stands for holiness and purity and righteousness, that while He was on that cross, the Bible says that God made Him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. In other words, our sin, God poured out on Him. Jesus did not become a sinner, but the sin that we commit, the sin that has been committed by every person that's ever lived, that ever will live, God pretended that that Jesus was the one who sinned and not us. And so He became our substitute. And Jesus, Jesus became the one who suffered for our sins. And during that three hour period of time, the Father turned His back on Him. And in those three hours, literally Jesus was taking our hell. And I, I think the light of the world went out for three hours. Because God the Father separated Himself from God the Son. Don't ask me how you can do that. But He separated Himself. He turned His back on Him and He poured out His wrath on Him for our sins. Jesus said, I am the light of the world and while I am in the world, I am light of the world. But one day He was going to be gone. One day the time was going to be up. And we couldn't work anymore. And then He says... When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and he made clay with saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which could be translated Shiloh. And he says, When he said these things, he spat on the ground. Now you know one of the things that the Jews said you weren't supposed to do was to spit on the ground. Y'all remember when we did that lesson? Some of y'all were here and, and some of you weren't. But they, they weren't supposed to spit on the ground on Sunday because the Jews said if you spit on the ground, you were making clay. And that was against the Sabbath rules. This is how ridiculous these people got about the Sabbath rules. Remember what I told you all about that? That you couldn't throw something up with one hand and catch it with the other. That you couldn't carry more than the weight of... Uh, a dried fig or half a dried fig twice. You could, if you were reaching out for something and the Sabbath came on you while you had your fork in your hand, you had to drop it. You could not turn on lights. You couldn't make fire, which God has said you couldn't make fire, you couldn't cook. But they came up with all these rules upon rules upon rules that were ridiculous. And one of them was you can't make clay. So what does Jesus do? He's literally, instead of, he's literally spitting in the face of the Pharisees because he's going to, we're going to find out in verse uh, 11 or 12, I think it is, somewhere in that vicinity that it, that, that it's the Sabbath. And so what does he do? He spits on the ground, he gathers up the clay, and he literally Forms two brand new eyeballs for that man. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, was it say that we were made of the dust of the ground, right? We were made of the earth. And I don't know if that's what God was doing or Jesus was doing, but it was a creative act. He was making the man two brand new eyes. And he put it on his eyes, and then he said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. This word Siloam, it, it, it really, which is translated sent, notice what he says. Go back to verse 4 where he says, I must work the works of him who sent me. And over and over and over again, Jesus said, I was sent by the Father. I was sent by the Father. And he says, as I am sent, I'm sending you, right? So this word Siloam is kind of interesting. Let me just read this, what I... What I found, uh, it says the Siloam Aqueduct, which is really translated shallow. We know what shallow is, right? Shallow was the name for Jesus. It means Messiah. We used to sing those songs about shallow. And he says the Siloam Aqueduct, opposite to the main part of Siwan, is the Virgin's Fount, ancient Gion whose waters are practically monopolized by the villagers. 
It is this water of waters of the spring which are referred to in Isaiah 8, verse 5 and 6. It says, For as much as the people have refused the waters of Shiloh, or Messiah, that go softly, now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river. That word Siloam, or Shiloh, means Messiah. So basically, what happened, let me try to put this in the terms y'all can understand. There was a pool up at the top, and it was called the Virgin Fount. And I don't know why they call it that, but all I know is there was a pool up top. And out of that pool, they made an artificial aqueduct, a tunnel to bring the water down to the pool of Shiloh, the pool of Siloam. And the pool that was the virgin fount was a picture of God sending His Son, Jesus, through the virgin. And what did He do? He sent the Messiah, right? So that pool that's called the virgin fount Found is a picture of God sending His Son through a virgin, sending Messiah, which is the pool. Does that make sense to y'all? And and so what he's saying is he's telling this man, go to Messiah, because the pool's name is Shiloh, which is translated sent. And so he says, go to Messiah, because he is the true light. Isn't that what he just said, Jack, back in chapter 8, verse 12? I am the light of the world. So that's as far as we're going to get today. But it says, so he went and washed and he came back seeing. And so Jesus created two brand new eyes for this man. And he sent him to the pool, which was a picture of the Messiah. Now later on, he's going to find him. He's going to... Tell him who he is, and the man's going to eventually believe that he's the Christ. He starts out not knowing who Jesus is because when he comes by, this man has no idea who Jesus is because he can't see, right? He can't see at all. And so the only way he knows he's there is when these guys start talking about that he sinned. And then Jesus spits on the ground. And a, could you imagine me standing there blind, and all of a sudden you feel somebody, you hear somebody spitting, and then the next thing you feel is this wet, nasty clay stuck on your eyes, <laughs> and you're thinking, "What in the world is this person doing to me?" Because see, a lot of these blind beggars and people were used to being spit on because you know what? They were considered scum. And don't we do the same thing a lot of times? We see people that are handicapped or are, you know, not like us or blind or different things, and because they're different from us, we dismiss them. And sometimes people ride by these people or walk by them and they spit on them because they think they're nothing. This man, when he was, when, when Jesus spit and he didn't feel nothing hit him, he probably thought, Hey, he missed. <laughs> but Jesus didn't miss. He spit on the ground because he wanted to make some clay and make some brand new eyes. Well, let's stop right there today. We've kind of run over and we got started late today. But the bottom line is, is Jesus is God and he wants to work in our life. He uses a variety of means and a variety of things to work in our lives. But the bottom line is... Is some folks he heals, some folks he don't. But ultimately one day we'll be healed in heaven, right? Why don't we sing number 57, the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. Hi, I'm Marty McKenzie with His Love Ministries. Please help us reach out to those the world has forgotten. Everyone we minister to is locked up in some way, shape, or form. Those in the nursing home facilities are locked up in bodies that do not work in a wheelchair or in a bed. We minister to children and youth who are locked up because of behavioral problems. Some have told us we want to have a real family because their parents have lost or given up custody of them. Other kids are locked up because they've committed crimes. We also minister to those locked up at the jails and the prisons, to those locked up in addictions, 
to drugs, alcohol, depression, and suicidal thoughts, to those locked up in a variety of other things that keep them from becoming who Jesus wants them to be. He came to give us abundant life, joy, and set us free. And these people that we minister to are not free. Our desire is to show them whatever their background, no matter what they've done, to see how much God loves them. We seek to help them receive forgiveness and freedom from their sin in Jesus Christ. We minister in the local area of Savannah, Georgia, and surrounding Effingham and Chatham area. We have recently expanded our ministry to the Lexington and Columbia, South Carolina area. We do over 2,000 services every year. We hope and pray that you will support us in some way that so we can continue our mission. Go to hisloveministries.net and click on the Donate Now button or send it via regular mail to Post Office Box 1881, Lexington, South Carolina, 29071. We hope and pray that you will do that. Thank you and God bless you. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. John 832.